Okay, so welcome to this OCHS uh, bonus tutorial, which I typically do for uh, my students. It's a drop in for four different courses, um, two philosophy courses, the Vedanta and Sankhya course, along with the three short Upanishads, and two narrative courses, the Mahabharata and the Puranas. So um, best used of our time is um, to either have questions where you ask me what it is you'd like to elucidate because the power of the, the live transmission is to deeply implant and to engage so I can gauge where you are to better implant whatever, um, uh, whatever kernels of knowledge I may have. And if I don't, I'll point you to somewhere else. Um, so um, questions and also even requests for exposition on certain topics. Hey, I'd like to hear more about that. What does that mean type thing? So is there anything top of mind? Feel free to either um, raise your hand or maybe use the chat function, either publicly or privately, whatever you prefer. Of course, one moment, please. It's 8 a.m. here. Yes, I see. Enjoy the day. Bye. When you're in the process of getting someone into an Uber and starting a tutorial all at the same time, we hold the glory of the modern Western world and all of this technological advances. Questions? Um, <clears throat> Dharma. <laughs> so um, I think I've um, posted a couple of posts and I, I think you've replied to them as well about um, yeah, no, all, all these interesting things that have come up since I've been looking into this dharma thing. Um, that you know, and like I think you said, it has all these wide um, definitions. But also, I think which was really interesting was this element that there was always this element that a person had some independence to voice their own opinions or their experience apart from the customs and the traditions and what the scriptures said. Um, and where, where do you see that voicing? So just to, just to be clear, so I understand what you're referring to. Where do I? Where do you see that voicing? What are you considering that, that voicing countering I, tradition? Where, I think where is did, that? I think in Mahabharata, Yudhishthira is doing the more kind of independent thinking. Okay, I, I, I see, I see, okay. I understand. I'm grokking where your question's coming from, which is why yeah. I love the live tutorials because I can read someone much better than through um, the chat medium. Um, yeah. Okay, so let me let me start by saying this: the Mahabharata is a uh, staggering, staggering text, in a good way for the most part. Um, and talking about the Mahabharata is not a waste of anyone's time because there is no Hinduism without the Mahabharata. Right? The Mahabharata is a very self-conscious epic narrative about Bharata, India, civilizational India, South Asia. So it's saying this is the great descendants of Mother India. This is, it's the formation, uh, the crystallization of classical Hinduism is accomplished primarily in the Mahabharata because there's so many competing voices and religious ideas of the day. So many, 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 but there are two overarching sources that we know of. We're not sure, we're not entirely sure about tribal religions. Um, we're not entirely sure about the Aryan, the, um, pardon me, the uh, Indus Valley civilization. But we do know that we have the voices of the Vedic ethos, this more martial, nomadic, pastoral, world affirming, uh, hymning, fire sacrificing ethos. And this ethos comes built in with it the valorization of the warrior, the hero of the Vedic texts of the ancient Vedic hymns is Indra, hero bar none, the, the, the primordial hero on his hero's journey to slay the dragon and save the day and save his people. That's Indra. And so we have this overarching ethos. And then we have this radically different ethos. It says, no, 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 fire sacrifice. Who needs that? Cast. Who needs that? Priests. Waste of time. Just wake up people like you know do your own funeral say goodbye to your kith and kin find a guru in the uh, in the forest or online whatever you prefer and wake up this upanishadic 
thrust that it's the same shamanic, I think of it as a cloud, right? Almost like cloud computing, but it's a, there's a cloud that congeals into the Upanishads that splinters off into Buddhism and Jainism and many other traditions that we're not even aware of anymore. Mm-hmm. But there's this, what I think of as a renouncer revolution. So what the Mahabharata does is the Mahabharata very consciously and very brilliantly takes stock of all of the religious ideas of the time. It takes stock. It is a a profound narrative conference of ideas. It's, It's a confluence of ideas. It's bringing in all of the various ideas. And you see the situations where you have Sulaba schooling Janaka, for example. Right, you have um, 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 uh, low castes and outcasts who have wisdom. Right, there is there is there is this Upanishadic, uh, ascetic um, uh, appeal to subvert the caste system because wisdom belongs to all of us because we all have an Atman. At the same time, you have the very sort of um, classes stratified Dharma of the Kshatriya, Dharma of the Brahmana. So when Yudhishthira is vocalizing his concerns it's brahmanism vocalizing the concerns of asceticism in order to fold them back in so the concerns that the characters are voicing are the concerns of tradition right one very very important distinction to draw that'll really help you a long way if you can grok this there's a world behind the text we know nothing about it very little about it there's a world within the text, right? We can read Shakespeare and maybe glean insights about Elizabethan England, but there'll be lots in Shakespeare that has nothing to do with Elizabethan England. Mm-hmm. So the Mahabharata, we're looking at the world within the text. We don't know if people behave like Yudhishthira. We don't know if this was hotly critiqued. We don't know if it took centuries for the text to really take hold. We just don't know what the reception mm-hmm. of this text was. And it's so complex um, the general scholarly consensus, aside from a, a small group of scholars following Al Hiltabaitl, the general consensus is that, is that the Mahabharata was centuries in the making. Mm-hmm. Hiltabaitl argues that over the course of a generation by committee it was made. But whether it was 400 BCE to 400 CE, that's the widest range I've seen. Some say 300 to 300, right? So straddling the centuries leading up to the common era and the centuries into the common era is the crafting of this gargantuan, labyrinthine, brilliant text that cobbles together this contradiction we think of as Hinduism. And the text is controversial and it's contradictory and it's vexing because Hinduism is just an umbrella term. I mean, the tradition itself knows that there's too much here to to be coherent. And so it folds in different strands, often through objections and and, and subtails. Uh, I don't know if any of that makes sense to anybody, but yeah, here we are. no, because I think you know, like when you said, okay, so Yudhishthira might be talking something from the point of view of the Brahmins, putting their view across over the Kshatriya dharm, but then also in there, there's that story um, where the Ashwamedh Yagya, which is, I suppose, the Brahmins would have been um, helping out with that one, um, but that the, uh, the Mongols, the Dhanraj, comes and says, oh, you know. Um, just giving charity by a poor couple uh, is much better than doing this big yagya. So again, there's that contradiction going on. Um, well, because, so how I think of that, and I keep returning to this idea, no matter how long or how deep I study the Mahabharata, right? It's, it's a simplistic idea, but I think it's a compelling idea. And there's a tension in Hinduism between world affirmation and world denial between caste duties and asceticism. And this tension doesn't go anywhere. It's very much part of the Hindu world today. And there are different responses as to how to reconcile it. But I, I come up with, I came up with this metaphor. Obviously, I'm not the first to notice this tension. Many, many scholars have noticed this tension, typically or often described as a tension between the householder and the renouncer. But it's not just the, the vocation or the social situation. There's an ideological um, um, opposition in terms of world affirmation and world denial, right? Mm -hmm. I call this the dharmic double helix because they're two strands intertwined. And so you see these two strands, you know, the duty of the Brahmin, the duty of the Kshatriya, let's figure that out, let's get that right. Oh, but let's not forget this wisdom that comes from what's beyond social duty. 
let's not forget this wisdom that comes that is available to anyone who's connected to their Atman. So it's folding in. You, one needs to bear in mind that originally ascetic traditions were entirely, it's like the, it's like what analogy, the Protestant Reformation to the Catholic world, for example. Ascetic traditions were a complete breakaway, even, even further than that analogy. They were a breakaway. They were completely subverting the Brahmanic fold. And over centuries, those philosophies and ideologies get folded back in. So it's a walking contradiction. And the Mahabharata masterfully weaves that contradiction in a compelling, gripping way. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Wait, where's the bell? There's a bell. I use it for clients and some of my school tutorials. You're welcome. Another happy customer. Who's next? <laughs> sure, Edmund. Uh, change of pace, uh, same topic, Dharma, uh, the Purana, book seven of the Bhagavata uh, uh, Purana. Uh, you, you have Palada there. And uh, uh, it seems that he's protected by Vishnu, and he's a devotee of Vishnu. And in this case, the relationship between father and son uh, is not respected at all. You know, that, that dharma is not respected. Uh, for some reason, the father wanted to kill the son, and then uh, Vishnu makes an appearance as an avatar and kills the father. You know, so it tells you that Vishnu protects the devotees, right? So it's a great Vaishnava type book or chapter, but uh, it, it's really different to what we just talked about in the Mahabharata, where there was a bit of tension between the family Dharma and the Dharma of, uh, of the right thing to do, right? In, yes. in this case, it's and not there. In one way to look at that story, one thing to bear in mind is uh, Prahlada's uh, uh, father, Hiranyakashipu, I believe, correct? Yeah. Is, um, he's literally a demon. He behaves in a demonic way, and he's insisting that the gods don't exist, or at least that they do not worship them, and he's saying, worship me, worship me. So he's like this, you know, um, I don't know if you've ever heard of these, these these rulers who are narcissistic and want to be worshipped, but they exist sometimes. Oh, yes. Yeah, they still exist. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Perhaps, perhaps. But worship me, worship me, worship me. And so that's toxic and corrosive, and that's adharmic. I mean, he's saying the divine doesn't exist, I am the divine worship me. That's so adharmic that Prahlada, his virtue lies in recognizing divinity and staying connected to divinity in the face of ignorance or evil even though it was his own father so in a sense it's interesting in that even in that story what you have is a subversion of social dharma you know obey your dad no matter what type thing yeah a subversion of social dharma where he's saying no no, no there are rules bigger than these 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 games that we make up as human beings to stay orderly yes you know yes 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 i could pick up a verse from the guru gita or many places that says you know um you know the guru gita says the guru is the father the mother friend i could pick up a verse that says um you're the the, the, the uh, mouth of deva baba pita deva baba the, the mother is god the father is god the guest is god the guru is god Okay, the father is God. Great. So Hiranyakashipu has it right. The father is God, and he's saying, "I'm God." So what's the problem? <laughs> that it's hyperbolic in a sense, but also one has to have the sense to understand Sanatana Dharma, that Dharma that's true no matter what the social rules are. And so, as Bhishma says in the Mahabharata, and Bhishma is extraordinarily wise, Dharma is subtle. Even the wise can barely grasp it. It's so difficult to, to know what's right to do in, in any given moment. Um, but yeah, there's that tension. There's definitely that tension, right? That tension, it's very um, theistic in that context, right? As you say, it's, it's Vaishnava. It's geared towards the veneration, the beautification, right? Uh, of Vishnu. And so there's that overlay yeah, for yeah. sure. But ir irrespective of that, I think there's something to be said there about recognizing the real from the unreal. And, and Prahlada recognizes that his father is a false god and that there yeah, is a real yeah. god. But he, he was a good son. 
he kept trying to educate the father. He kept giving him speeches about, you know, what's <laughs> right, what's wrong, you know, and, uh, but the father, you know, wouldn't listen. What can you do? What can you do? All, what he can tried. you do besides? All you can do is take incarnation as half man and half lion and rip him apart. That's all you can do. <laughs> That's Vishnu's, <laughs> Vishnu Narasimha incarnation. Um, great. Dharma. Dharma, yes, yes please, Kate, go ahead. One of the things which is bothering me is that when Yudhishthira plays and gambles away his wife, mm. himself, everything else, and that's the time he's allowed to do that because he's Kshatriya. And immediately after he has done that, and the, the, everybody is suffering because of his one action, which is a wrong action according to me or according to everybody, I'm sure. <laughs> and then we are now asking him that, yeah, you've done all this as a Kshatriya, but now I don't want to be a Kshatriya and I want to do something else. And I, I do not agree with all the Kshatriya, the wars and this and that, and I don't like the killing. Now, it is very difficult for a man to, I mean, I don't think at any point it is even recognized or it was said that, oh, he did the wrong thing. And now I don't like what I did as a Kshatriya and I want to not um, carry on with the, with the rules of Kshatriya Dharma. Now, can you explain me? I mean, I'm not a scholar, but I just, whenever I read this, these are the contradictions which I find very difficult to gulp because there's no explanation anywhere. Yeah, I've done wrong, but I don't think I've done wrong because I've done a Kshatriya's duty. But after that, can you tell me now I should be, I don't want to do this, but what, what, do, what do you think about it? How do you explain this? I think these are astute questions. And I think the text, um, any gripping storytelling, whether it's uh, the, the cinema, whether it's spoken aloud, whether it's a novel, gripping storytelling isn't neutral. Isn't, it's not something that, oh, okay, that was okay, cool. It's something that arouses emotion. It's something that makes you think, that makes you question. And the Mahabharata does that. And it seems to me that that's purposeful. The Mahabharata is purposefully drawing the reader into these moral questions because the Mahabharata is questioning the morality of Yudhishthira in that moment. Now, there's different responses. Clearly, the Mahabharata is being provocative, but unlike uh, garden variety trolling, it's not provoking you just to, de just to derail you and deplete you of energy. It's provoking you in a pedagogical way. It's pedagogical provocation. It's trying to teach you something, or at least trying to have you figure something out for yourself. Now, that it's doing that, I think everyone can agree how we make sense of that. Or what, what, that it is making a statement, definitely. What that statement is, that'll depend from person to person, scholar to scholar, etc. In my view, the epics really problematize Kshatriya Dharma. They problematize the dharma of the warrior because of the violence it requires. An excellent example is Rama hunting Valin from hiding. Mm. He's, he's, he's behaving like a hunter. This is Rama. He's behaving like a hunter. And he's telling, he's telling this man, this monkey man, that I, oh, I, can hunt, I can hunt you whenever I want. It doesn't make any sense. How do you form alliances and have human rules for the Vandaras and then hunt them like animals? I think the epics are problematizing Shatya Dharma very much. But sorry, I just want to ask you one more thing. Is that after all this, then when they talk about Gita and when in Gita, you are still talking about the caste systems. I mean, what does it promote? Does it not promote? I mean, it's a, is they say caste is, is according to your work or is it according to your birth? Because throughout Mahabharata, it is according to the birth. And, and now I, I, I get confused between um, teaching of Gita and then Mahabharata behind that and actions of people. Yes, it raises questions. But how do you know the answers? Because if Gita can't give me an answer, what is going to give me an answer? So what or you're how? asking for is the meaning of life, essentially. No, no, not really that. But I mean, whether you are promoting the caste system or you are not promoting the caste system, because the whole 
story is, you know, and I don't know how to promote caste system, basically, that's why I have a big objection to it. But I just wonder, I mean, it is a confusing, the whole thing is confusing, and that's why the caste systems are still propagated in India. That's what I think, because the whole, nothing has been clearly said that this is wrong or right. Well, the caste system is definitely a, 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 a powerful driving force in Indian society, and by all evidence, it's been a powerful driving force for literally thousands of years, maybe more so with the Jati system than because yeah, caste can be a little fluid, but that yeah. that system or that consciousness is, 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 is an enormous element of traditional historical Indian or Hindu society. Now, over the last hundred years, especially a couple, well, since colonial times, but you know, certainly in the last hundred years, there have been various um, wisdom teachers, various um, speakers, thinkers who have a vested interest in reforming that and reinterpreting, in my view, reinterpreting um, tradition to say that it's by swabhava, by disposition. That is a very powerful idea in Indian culture. Swabhava, the nature of the person. That's a very, very powerful and pervasive idea. And in my view, wise, because anybody who's had a, a one-year-old understands people arrive with certain dispositions. They're finicky in certain ways, whether it's eating or sleep. You know, people change over time, but it's so palpable uh, from a very, very young age. You know, so this idea of swabhava is compelling. Now, it, just because, uh, how do I say we are looking at cultural artifacts from a very long time ago. We live in a very different time. So it's incumbent upon the modern receiver of these traditional texts to receive them as they see fit, to take what they can from them, to separate the wheat and the chaff, pending what they consider the wheat and the chaff. Now, and as you probably well know, the caste system and the Jati system holds great sway but so much of the hindu world it's it's people have occupations all you know brahmins are financial traders and vaishyas are wisdom teachers and it's like you know there are circles who care a great deal and there always will be in all cultures who care a great deal about standing and social standing and there are people who really don't blink at the last name as they would with a Western last name, it's just a last name, right? So it's up to the individual, I think, to make sense of that as they will. But that confusion is there. And unfortunately, there are no straight answers. There are no, this is what it means. It's an art more than a science. Yeah, you're right. I wish it would not propagate the wrong things, that's it. But, it oh, well, but, but how do we, but listen, listen. How do we know the wrong things? How do we know that we don't have blind spots? How do we know? For how long did we live on this earth thinking that... that... Then what is dharma? If we can't decide what is right and wrong, what is dharma? No, we can. But universally, like it's a, it's a conversation. AI is coming into the fore. There's no Shastra scripture that talks about AI. We have to now figure what is the dharma of AI. What is our dharma with relation to AI? Um, 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 various ways in which people can conceive a child where they couldn't before, uh, the surrogacy, etc. What is the dharma? Tradition has never encountered these things. So this is a conversation we have to have with ourselves, you see. Having said that, uh, you know, I'm sort of the love child between tradition and innovation. So, you know, there's... <laughs> Tradition has much to share, um, but of course, in, in my view, at least, um, one needs to be innovative in how it is interpreted and applied because we live in an unprecedented time, yeah. without question. Thank you. What other questions, comments? These are your three options. You can ask me about course material from the module this week. You can ask me about the Hindu jungle at large, or you could ask me about the mysteries of life, the meaning of existence. You know, those are the three orders. <laughs> I would like to ask about the names of Vishnu. I'm in the Purana course, and I haven't read, I've read, uh, I did the Mahabharata course, but 
I don't, I'm not familiar with many uh, Hindu teachings. And I see that there are various names of Vishnu, which seem to relate to different aspects of Vishnu. And I wonder if, if I'm interpreting that correctly, and if these are considered consistently across all of the religious texts. I, I understand your, your question. So one of the differences uh, in, in consciousness and in how we think of, of this is names as labels. My name is John. John's my name. John's the label of me. All right. Right. Um, versus names as descriptions, epithets. I am John Smith. So I come from a family of Smiths because we live in this, this Western caste system. I'm teasing. My jati is Smith. We're Smiths. So I'm John Smith. Right. Um, names in, the, in that context, the epithets and names of the divine are names like Hail, Holy Mother, Ashley, Veronica, Jordana, Hail to Susanna. It's, 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 it's Hail, Holy Mother, Mother of Time you know, consort of so-and-so. In their descriptions, they emphasize the attribute of the divine and they can be useful for contemplation in terms of, you know, if you're, if you're starting off to, to inv say you're doing an invocation or prayer to Ganesha and say you're going to start the hundred names of Ganesha or the thousand names and they're both, right? You, um, um, uh, um, uh, Lambo Dharayanamaha, Ekarandhayanamaha, uh, hail to the big bellied one. You're not saying... Ganesha, go on a diet, man. You're saying you're a big, jolly Santa Claus. This is abundance. This is grounding. You're the Lord of grounding. You have to have a gravitas. Skinny Ganesha doesn't work. He's the Lord of grounding, right? So uh, hail to the to, to, to Lambodara, to the big bellied one. Um, Ekadanta. Hail to the, to, to the one with a, a single tusk. Ekadanta isn't a name, it's a description. Eka, one. Danta, dentist, tooth. Um, uh, Hail to the one who destroys obstacles. So the names of the deities are actually descriptions of their functions. So while you may think it's about the deity, and of course it's about praising the deity, when you pay careful attention, you are connecting to what the deity can do for you. The aspect of the epithet of the deity will give insight into the manner in which the, de the deity blesses. It'll also uh, it'll also uh, engage the the mythology of the deity, right? So one of the names of Ganesha can be um, brother of Skanda, right? Shiva Sutta in Maha, Shiva Sutta, Shiva Sutta, the son of Shiva. Uh, Parvati Priyaya Namaha, the beloved of Parvati. So if I'm invoking Ganesha, you are the beloved of Parvati. That's a different aspect of Ganesha than Big Bellied One. See? Does that answer your question or does that just confuse you further? No, thank you. Oh, good. Another one. Okay, who's next? Um, does Sanatana Dharma mean universal overarching values? Yes. So that's, <laughs> there are great fascinations about this word Dharma that I mentioned in the chat form has been in vogue in use for thousands of years. Think about when you read Shakespearean English, some of the words you have no idea why they're using that word in that context, but they do. Mm -hmm. Or in present times, if you fly over the pond, and, you know, you may go, if you're from the UK, you may go to um, America and, and, you know, a diaper, that's a nappy, you know, or the other way around, you may be from America, you go to the UK and you're like, someone offers you a jumper and you're like, I don't need jumper cables. What are you talking about? No, 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 a jumper is a sweater. Right. So words take on different meanings and different connotations in different spaces and different times. Imagine doing that for thousands of years of religious history and imagine using that word as a technical term in specific texts. So it's an extraordinarily rich word. One of the great intrigues about the word Dharma is all of that rich richness and diversity to describe um, to refer to individuals, dharmas based on caste, gender, religion etc 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 
that is held in tandem with the idea of the dharma like the tao like the force you know truth is dharma is founded on truth well what dharma who's dharma the dharma of the teacher the dharma of the the the, the, the butcher the baker the candlestick maker who's dharma no dharma this 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 colorless odorless gas this virtue this sanatana dharma this dharma that does not change with time so, eternal dharma is there a um there a definition of that in the Mahabharata? Is it? I haven't read it. There are, well, the Mahabharata doesn't deal in definitions. Narrative rarely does. So there's, you know, described yeah. as, yeah. for example, Ahimsa is the, is the most supreme dharma. Right. There are passages where the word Sanatana comes up. Okay. Right. But there are passages where they pan away from the, the dharma. You know, you're a warrior, go to your warrior dharma. They pan out. They switch mm -hmm. to camera two, where they're now looking at Dharma, capital D Dharma. Right. So they, they, they toggle between camera one, individual Dharma, and then Dharma. camera two, no Dharma. And mm -hmm. when one needs to understand that, because what if one says, you know, Dharma is founded on, uh, Ahimsa is the most supreme Dharma, which may well be true <laughs> from an emic perspective. But they're not saying the Dharma of a butcher. They're not saying the Dharma of a soldier. They're not, the, you know, they're not saying camera one Dharma. This is... Mm -hmm. So that's that's part of what's happening with that word. Oh, Mahabharata, a wonderful scholar, great storyteller. She happened to be one of my instructors in undergrad, University of Toronto, and how times have changed. Um, <laughs> she's now uh, still at the University of Toronto, uh, but she asked for some help setting up a podcast. I was more than happy to help because she's a fantastic storyteller. I'm just going to get the URL for you, the Mahabharata podcast.com with Archie Dond. Um, you may be interested if you're into yeah. the Mahabharata or you like podcasts. Great storytelling, very witty, and very modern in the rendition. Mm -hmm. That might be of interest to you. Uh, this is a public service announcement. Obviously, I, don't, I get no kickback from this plug. <laughs> I just, I feel passionate about. Can you tell us again where to get it from? Yeah, I just put the link in the chat, the mahabharatapodcast.com. Or you if you if you have podcast platforms like Apple or Stitcher, or whatever you use, then you can, yeah. same, with, same with my podcast. You can get it in any podcast platform. But if you go to that website, you can download the straight from website. Okay. Hey. Please. Hi. Uh, I'm doing the Puranas course uh, currently. And I have actually uh, two questions to you, Raj, and uh, one of the observations from the Mahabharata, which you've been discussing, uh, a comment. Uh, the first question is, um, me being a practicing Hindu and living in India currently, um, you know, yesterday we were talking about uh, the future of Hinduism, Professor, uh, we heard from him. And, uh, you know, we, I see three, four parts of Hinduism being taught from the OCH course itself, you know. One is on the, um, we, we're doing the Bhagavad the Purana, the Digasams and Puranas, and then you have the epics such as Mahabharata and Ramayana. And we also know, you know, in the earlier days, we had Upanishad, Rig Vedas, etc. Uh, if you look at a common man living in India who is a Hindu, who is a practicing Hinduism, like how, you know, Edmund put a question to us also. Uh, they do not know about Idikasam. They do not know about Puranas. And uh, while we have learned stories from all of them, you know, in bits and pieces, uh, as a whole, Unless you are uh, a sage getting into a monastery, getting into a deep into Vaishnavism and getting into the Rig Vedas, people do not know about this. So uh, what is the reason or cause do you think? Is it, uh, I'm not saying is it good or bad not to know about it, but why aren't people enthusiastic to get into our own traditions? What could be the causes of it, you think? And is this going to decline? Uh, from where we are, uh, because I, I don't even see such online courses in India, for example, other than Oxford, very little where it happens. That's number one. It's been 
going on in my mind from the time I took this course. Um, and the second question is uh, on the bhakti. Um, so if you look at Shaivism or if you look at Vaishnavism uh, or if you um, look at Upanishads or Rig Veda or whatever, you know, what they say bhakti is, um, there is God within yourself. That is what I have understood from the basic learnings which I have learned. And uh, another form of bhakti is love along with compassion. Um, this is what I have learned in the entire Hinduism. Uh, you've been doing other courses. So for example, if you look at Buddhism, uh, you know, in this very small book, Dalai Lama's Cat, you see Buddhism also speaks in the same manner. They don't have a God or a figure, uh, but they too speak in the same manner. So the um, overarching umbrella of bhakti, is it what I have understood or are there any other branches, etc.? That is my second thought. And the comment, yes, on the Mahabharata, I do agree with you, Raj. It's such a complex uh, character uh, story with complex characters, I would say. Uh, even in the, uh, Ketki was saying that it is not dharma of uh, Yudhishra, uh, you know, to do such act. You know, there are numerous acts like that in Mahabharata. You, right. you look at the war, war itself, uh, you know, uh, the way, Arjuna's son was killed uh, the way, you know, the uh, wars, the Dharma says that no women should fight, but Krishna himself brings a uh, woman to fight. So uh, there are lots and lots of complex characters in Mahabharata. And I agree with you that that is what makes it so special because you need to really pick out what resonates with you. Uh, because Ramayana, Ramayana is a, a clean slate, according to me, other than one episode of Rama killing, which you said, uh, you know, the good always does the good and the bad always does the bad. But here Mahabharata is such a complex uh, mix of characters. Um, I do agree with you on that. That was just a comment I thought I would make. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, see, in which order should I respond to that? Uh, which of, wait, these are just random thoughts. Uh, which I well, not as not 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 random. They're fairly thought out, but I understand what you mean. Um, um, I'll respond to the last first. So, with respect to the Mahabharata, the 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 Mahabharata, for the very same reason that it is vexing, upsetting, troublesome, that is the very same reason for which it is relevant. Yeah, because life is vexing. And it's so difficult to know what the right thing to do is in a given juncture. I am discharging my duty as an instructor. I had a duty as a family member and time conflict. So the duty of the general comes in to manage it. You go in an Uber. I'm going to teach my students. The dharmas can be. What if Uber didn't exist? Which duty do I pick? Who gets stuck not being served in the way they deserve to be served by me? I'm one person. Mm -hmm. This is a small, teeny, teeny thing that took five seconds to manage, maybe five minutes. The call just came in to say, I'm in the Uber. I'm like, yes, it is. Don't worry. They didn't realize I called the Uber for my app so I can see that. I did that on purpose so I, can, I would know that they're okay even when the call was on multitasking i'm sharing this ridiculous story because this happens in you know you're testifying in a court case should you lie to save your 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 partner your husband your child or not what if you know they're innocent but the evidence is stacked against them and the prosecution has some bias should you perjure yourself break the law uh, breach, uh, breach satya, this major precept, so that the right verdict can be reached. This is life. The Mahabharata is vexing because life is vexing. And there's this beautiful idea. I love the idea that everything ages. I made a joke on Facebook the other day. There's, there's more salt in my pepper this year. <laughs> I've got so many responses. One was, salt is the new pepper. <laughs> Everything ages. <laughs> and this idea that even Dharma ages. 
with time, everything decays, even Dharma decays. This idea that in the Kali Yuga, Dharma, the cow of Dharma is not on four legs, not on three, not on two, it's on one leg. This image stays with me. How can a cow function standing on one leg? This is Dharma in our age, what is right. This is how difficult it is to find poise when, when engaged in deliberations of Dharma. So there's that, that beautiful idea of the, uh, is, it, is it a pessimistic idea? Is it a realistic idea? Is it, is it an optimistic idea? You can be the judge, but the Mahabharata is complex. The decisions are hopeless. The good guy's hands are smeared in blood. The bad guys have no shortage of virtues. Behold, forget 50 shades of gray, 50,000 shades of gray. This is the Mahabharata. Behold, there are no black and white characters. Okay, great. Um, the, the, uh, pursuing the other two major points. Um, devotion, compassion is an ideal, right? Human perfection, detachment, compassion. Anyone with any innate wisdom or training in a wisdom tr tradition understands that this is not something you do because you'll get Facebook likes by sharing that you bought ice cream for a, a, an orphan five-year-old. You do it because you feel for that child who may have never had an ice cream cone or this year hasn't had one. You buy one, you feel for that person. There's empathy, there's compassion. This is a human virtue, right? That compassion and attachment has to do with human perfection. Being a saint, being a sage, being someone who has that, that muscle mass, if you will. Devotion is a much lower barrier of entry. Do you know how to love? Do you have the capacity to love? The way you love your kids, the way you love your partners, the way you love, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Devotion is much more accessible to people en masse, the masses, if you will. That can be a pejorative term. I don't mean it pejoratively, but the, 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 the multitudes of people on this planet, the vast majority of them, minus the sociopaths, are capable of love and so i can love the divine i can be in loving relationship with the divine i'm capable of that i am not capable necessarily of doing good works charity work i'm certainly not capable i'm saying you know perhaps for many i'm not capable of studying the shastras you know jnana is not a path that i can do Karma is barely a path that I can do. Bhakti, I can do. I can cultivate love, right? So that's, that is uh, a compelling idea. What, now, I did them in reverse order. Returning to your initial point. The initial point had to do with the future of Hinduism and, and, and the engagement or non-engagement of, you know, will our traditions die out because no one's studying them? I think that, this isn't a question of East to West or, or Hinduism versus other traditions. In my perspective, and I can only share my perspective, right? In my perspective, this is, a, this, is, um, n this is not to do with Hinduism. Humanity is composed of different aptitudes and personality types. And if I'm... Um, doing a ride share or maybe taking the subway Toronto has a subway system, whatever, just in the, in the supermarket, um, picking up groceries. Let's just say everyone in the room is Christian. I mean, I live in Toronto is the world's diverse, most diverse city, but imagine I was in an entirely Christian context just to make it simple. Say I went an hour or two away from Toronto. Okay. Um, say everybody's Christian. Let's just say they're all devout. Who's really read the Gospels closely? Who's read the secondary scholarship on them? Who understands the, 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 the you know, textual criticism? Who's read Thomas Aquinas? Who's read Plato? Who cares? Right? You may care. I may care. So it's a question of who is interested and equipped to engage in ideas to engage in the production of knowledge to to understand the, his, the history behind anything everything this is a niche the vast majority of people 
they're not going to go read the Puranas because the power of the Puranas, actually their power is that they don't need to be read by people to be transformative and informative. The power of the Puranas is that everybody knows the story of Pralada. Everybody knows the story of Krishna and Yashoda, in, uh, the, which story? There's so many. Uh, the dirt in Krishna's mouth. Everyone knows that story throughout the diaspora, Diana, Trinidad, all parts of India. This is staggering. Do you understand that a billion people at least know that story without trying to know that story or studying that story? That's the power. The power of Purana is stories that live uh, on tongues, in hearts, in minds, in souls. There may be nerdy people, you know, there may be uh, people like me who are interested in looking at them and studying them formally. And maybe folks like myself will have an impact on knowledge production, the production of knowledge on the Puranas, right? That's different from engaging in the power of Purana. Because when that story is imprinted on you, it impacts your behavior. Now, many Hindus come at the OCHS or wherever, whatever platforms I teach at, they're, 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 they're quote-unquote Westerners, whatever that means, and, and, and Hindus, whatever that means in these days, and they are discovering or rediscovering tradition. For those interested, once it's pointed out to you the power of why Ganesh is first among the gods, the power of why Yashoda sees the universe in Krishna's mouth, then you may have a series of intellectual epiphanies, but even if those epiphanies aren't there and you don't study it at all, you don't know where that passage is from. You have no idea which Purana the Pralada story is from. You can barely remember the name of Hiranyakashipu. Still, you have in the back of your brain, do the right thing even if your own father tells you to do something wrong. You see, that's the power of Purana. Enough pontificating for me for one day. Marilyn, please. <laughs> I think it was in uh, last week's session that you said the text is on the tongue. I think that was you. If not, it should have been you. <laughs> well, I, I, <laughs> no, think it is as, I, I think it is as well. I said it in lecture <laughs> one day and someone made a meme out of it. And I think they posted it on Instagram or something. It's hilarious. But that's what you're saying is that you don't have to read it to understand it. You hear it, you say it, you speak it, you see it on television, you hear it in radios. Uh, and it's in your life, even if you haven't read a word of it. I think. And <laughs> You know, and, and also just to, just to switch it up, um, you know, I understand the concern about other cultures disappearing because of globalization or, or Western culture. I get that entirely. I'd say this is related to that, but it's also, it's also who studies Shastra, period. Who's, who studies sacred texts, period. How many, say, Americans know what's right because Jesus says so, or the priest says so, or, you know, this is the way it is. How many have read the scriptures? How many of them, how many people understand the world behind the text of Deuteronomy compared to the world behind the text of the gospels? And what a, what a uh, glaringly different world that is and different purpose, uh, the different purposes of these texts. That's, that's not for people who aren't particularly nerdy or interested or passionate or all three, right? And so, uh, this is what we've got. We've got the the work of the work of figuring these things out can't be downloaded to the individual. It can't down, hand it off, delegated, not downloaded, delegated. The individual is not capable. The individual, most individuals cannot do their own taxes. I cannot. Cannot fix their own carburetors. I cannot. They're supposed to figure out the spiritual, theological, religious truths of the ancients. I think not. So that's much of the challenge. But people know the story of Moses. If I say burning bush, even in an article, right away, whether they realize it or not, so much ideology and so many values come to mind. And Western civilization is living in a tent of Abraham without realizing it. So the unconscious value systems of our civilization, our Western civilization, they come from Genesis and Exodus, and we don't realize it. Why? Because those stories are extraordinarily powerful. In the back of the brain, whether people are believers or not consciously, in the back of the brain is internalized this worldview of a masculine creation myth, right? So the stories are, 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 the stories are very powerful. 
right? They're, 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 they are the most effective means of conditioning people, in my view. Blah, 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 you. blah. You're welcome. Who's next? Edmund, please. Unmute yourself. I'm, I don't want to waste my psychic powers this early in the morning. So. Oh, sorry. I turned it off because of my dog. He was barking. Now, my, my question was about how long would it take to talk about the meaning of life? Can we separate a session? Yes, to go through that. Well, it would take no time at all. <laughs> Is it that simple? <laughs> it's, it's beyond the sway of time. Oh, no, sure. We can talk about all kinds of things. Existential questions. Sure, why not? I don't see why not. I'm here, you're here. But you'd have to, um, you'd have to be a little more specific. Because the various religions, part of what they do is create rules for, so for society. They have a sociocultural function. But the religions of the world, they also have a psycho-spiritual function. They have a function of alerting us to higher truths, higher planes of consciousness. They have, part of their function is meaning making. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it's not overt, but I think that I think stories are where that's best done. Stories are meaning machines. They teach us how to make meaning of things. But um, Hinduism has a variety of responses for what, what makes meaning in life. And I think it'll depend upon the individual and their own values. But perhaps the overarching meta narrative is the pursuit of moksha, the pursuit of self enlightenment mm. that is regarded as the paragon of human perfection. It's not the only pursuit, it's not the only aim. Moksha is one of four aims, for example. Not everybody uh, is on an active path to pursue moksha in this life. And, and that's good and well because. According to the Hindu worldview, we have many. What's your rush? Stop and smell the roses. <laughs> and you have many lives. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. We have many, there are many lives. So you may or may not be on one way or actively gunning for the finish line in this life. Mm -hmm. We have a few more minutes. What burning questions might you have? Can I upload this tutorial to, um, I have a YouTube account that I never use, but in previous semesters, I've uploaded them to YouTube for people to, to, to view. I think that'd be a little easier than my school website. Is that okay with you? Say it again, sorry. Can I upload this video to YouTube? Is that okay with you? That's where I've uploaded them in the past. Otherwise, I might be able to upload them on my school platform. I don't think the OCHS has a place where I can upload them. So I was thinking YouTube would be the easiest place. So I can share the link with our classmates who wanted the recording. Yeah. Okie doke. Great. Yeah. Um, what are the questions you have? We have a few more minutes. Uh, Raj, uh, um, I know there'll be some assignments coming up, right? There's uh, what? Assignments? Yeah, there will be something here. <laughs> <laughs> now, when we are confused like this, I really wonder what we are going to start and what point. I mean, at this moment, the reason I joined the course is I wanted a little bit more clarity, but I don't think. And you got and the opposite. And it's too early, but I can't, as you say, it's, it's, you accept it as it is and it's supposed to raise, raise questions, but I'm not getting answers. It's just raising questions. That's, a, so I'm a little bit worried well, about. You, you're in the Mahabharata course, correct? No, I, did, uh... what, I think a, a great way perhaps to focus an assignment is by taking a character any character hmm. and doing That's a deep deep dive into a character and you don't even need to have an answer or have a, a an, an argument for this type of assignment you could even simply do a character step, sketch spend some quality time with that character get to know them see what comes I think that might be one way one approach you could take I, I thought of one or two things which I will write down to you and then what you should sure. so that I can concentrate on that area. Because I read the book and I, I know the stories. I don't think I know the essence of everything, but I've read enough of stories. But what I want to do is possibly write one or two things which I want to achieve and 
you can guide me with that I'll sure, no what problem i'm planning to do yeah sure Thank why you. not yes yeah. my pleasure happy to help to facilitate your learning Thank you. Rather, rather than um, finding answers. Yeah. It was very helpful. Thank you. You're welcome. This is why I love these live Zoom yeah. sessions. They just they add a whole different dimension. What's the time where you are in? Ca you are in Canada. I'm in the the uh, the nation of Canada. I'm in the holy city of Toronto. And in the holy okay. city of Toronto, there are <laughs> there um, we are on Eastern time, Eastern Standard Time. So it's the same time as New York and you know, the Eastern Seaboard, essentially. So what's the time there now? I mean, it's five hours. Are you in, are you in the UK or are you elsewhere? Yeah, in the UK. So it's five hours before. Um, oh, okay, not so bad. GMT. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So one PM for you, eight AM for me. Yeah. That part of the challenge, right? Part of the challenge. I mean, it's great to have the live Zoom sessions. Part of the challenge is the various time zones, right? Depending on where most of the students are. Many of the students are in the UK, unsurprisingly. I typically hold them early in the morning for this side of the pond so that people can participate. I've also, um, I've also tried them at 7 p.m. UK time, thinking people are off work. It doesn't quite work out as well, I think. But that's the, another time that works. So midday UK time or end of the day UK time. And how do I know that? For four or five semesters, I did surveys. I literally would send emails out and say, these are the times and people would pick times. And after four semesters, I was like, why am I sending these surveys? They're always the same times-ish, which is eight-ish in the morning or for me or 2 p.m. for me. So that's what we're doing. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Burning questions, comments, complaints, um, insights. Oh, here's everyone. Oh, that's a great that's a great way to start. I think we talked about that last week, but no, that's a great way to start, to start. Let's end with that. We'll end with that. So, where's everybody calling in from? Massachusetts, UK, UK, India. Um, in Bharat. Toronto. You're in the outskirts of Toronto. Are you in Mississauga? Are you in, are you in Toronto? Uh, Thorn Hill. Thorn Hill. Got it. Yes, so just, little, just a teeny bit north of Toronto. Very, very yeah. interesting. Great. Well, I love the fact that we can all participate in a um, live tutorial. Yes. One, one last um, question. From what you have learned, Raj, from what you have studied, observed, all these uh, things, um, is there a way to win karma? To win karma? What do you mean win karma? Conquer? Yes. Of course. I mean, I, I mean, are you asking about the traditional view? Yes. The, 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 the traditional view is that's what moksha is. Moksha is the conquest of karma. It's to use the terms that you're using to win, to conquer, to, to transcend, okay. if you will. Okay, you say moksha. Okay, okay. So, so karma is what binds you to samsara. So managing your ripening karma without creating more karma hmm. is part of the formula of being liberated from the karmic field, which is the field of this world. Got it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Excellent. I'm glad we answer, could answer that in 30 seconds. Okay. But actually the question which... Um, I actually meant this is a perfect answer, a traditional textbook answer, I would say. <laughs> but uh, I, I meant in the current life, how do you overcome your past karma? Depends on whether it depends in one in one cor Okay, uh, if those of you need to go, by all means go. It is a stroke of nine a.m. here, which is two p.m. there. So be well, and if you've got a few minutes. Uh, interestingly enough, my next call is 9.15, so I do have some time. Um, I'll be here. We can continue. So in this current life, I'm giving you the answer according to tradition, right? This is what tradition would say, okay? Mm. We're all in a human body, and we all have circumstances. And all that we experience, right, are a result of our karma from previous actions, so karma is the principle, the action-reaction principle. Karma is also the fruits of that. Oh, come down. Right? 
what's ripening. No. Okay. Karma is also free will, the actions we take. So karma refers to three different things. It's the principle. It's free actions. The actions that we take, this is the karmas that we're creating. Um, and our karma can be what's ripening for us, or our destiny, if you will. Okay. In this life, we all have, from all of our lives, we have a storehouse of karma. It's called mm -hmm. Sanchita. It's a storehouse. We have no clue what's in there from how many lifetimes. What we know is what's ripening now for us and what will continue to ripe for the duration of the life. That is the piece of the invisible bank that's ripening in our field currently. Now, while things are ripening, we're not just sitting there, you know, receiving checks, receiving bills, doing nothing. We're creating more karma. We're engaged in creating more karma. So to answer your question, for any given individual, it depends on how much they have in their sanchita, how much karma they have to exhaust still. If, even if they have a lot, if they, have, if they are capable of great insight, then Yoga Sutras is saying that the, 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 um, the state of yoga can burn the seeds, toast the seeds, roast the seeds. And what happens to the roasted seeds? Well, they might be tasty if they're pumpkin seeds, but the point is when you roast the seeds, they don't sprout. So if you have a methodology whereby you can roast the seeds through jnana or through some powerful tantric mantras, for example, you want to roast the storehouse of seeds and secondly, you want to manage what's coming up for you. You may have a person in your life who's very difficult, and that person may be related to you by chance. And it's, it's not so easy as just avoiding them and practicing boundaries. It might be a lifelong tug of war. So one has to manage what's ripening for them without creating more karma. But when someone hits you upside the head, for most of us, the instinct is to follow suit but now we've created more karma. So toasting the storehouse, managing the product of what's ripening and gaining the insight to not create any more. If you can do that, <laughs> then you're done. You're done the game. You've, you've, you've conquered the video game. Uh, that then we are, we are, when you are talking about karma and destiny, I just think of the Dutrashtra when he he uh, he just forgets about it. He says, no, no, this is the destiny. Let the war continue or let the war start. I mean, he leaves it to the destiny because that's the des destiny. But that's not correct, is it? There's no karma. He's supposed to stop and tell his son no. Well, it depends. It depends. Either he had a choice and he just blamed his destiny because he's a coward. Correct, or yeah. he truly or truly he never had a choice because destiny made him a coward for that purpose, depending on how you view it. Yeah. But I will say um, in Indian traditions, it's not as simple as destiny or free will. In Indian traditions, it's both and. It's rarely either or in general. Destiny is a force and free will is a force. There are times where things are destined, they're going to happen no matter what. Mm -hmm. Right, there are times when um, we have wiggle room. Some of us have more wiggle room than others, but certain things that are meant to happen are going to happen no matter who does what. But that yeah. doesn't mean everything is meant to happen. So it requires a little bit of sophistication in your processing. Okay, enough wisdom teachings for one day. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, take care. Bye, Bye for now. Thank you.